Good morning, Restore Community Church. It is my pleasure to be with you once again. If you've not met me before, it is my pleasure to introduce myself. My name is Dustin Pruitt. Uh, I'm one of the ministers here at Restore Community Church, and it is my pleasure to be bringing you week three of the Love the Lord Your God series that we are going in over this summer. And may I say, it is wonderful that summer has arrived as I'm recording this Today, it is a beautiful sunny day, hardly a cloud in the sky, a a wonderful, uh, I'm converting to Celsius in my head, 23, 24 degrees, Um, so close. My ideal is 28, uh, 28 and sunny. It's just such a lovely time, just the lightest sheen of sweat as you're hanging out in the shade, enjoying the warmth that will soon leave us. Uh, But all that to the side, here we are, week three of loving the Lord your God, and we are talking about loving Him with all of our soul. Now this can be a confusing one. The whole concept of a soul is is often argued by theologians even today. So let's kind of dive into it. The, The verse we're using as our standpoint for this whole series is in Matthew 22, Verse 36 is where I'm starting. They asked him, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Now this is back in the Old Testament, the Torah, first five books of the Bible. And Jesus quotes one of those. And he says, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So here we are. Loving God with all of your soul is important. Jesus listed it out with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. We covered the heart last week. We're on the soul today. So if you're missing one of the three, you're, you're out of luck. You got to have all three. So what's, what's this soul business? That loving God with all your soul is a part of it. But what, is it, what does that even mean? Can, we, can I visualize this of the heart? We can kind of visualize our mind. We can kind of visualize our thinking center. We, here in, in modern day English, we think this is our emotions. We think of this as our thinking. When, when back in that day, the heart was your thinking and your emotions just squished into one thing. That was your heart. But what's this soul business? The soul, it, it, it's, it's kind of harder. Is it, is it my ghost? If my body collapsed right now, would my soul rise up out of it and make its way to heaven? What, like that's the cartoony version that uh, I, I watching Scooby-Doo or one other cartoon growing up. That's kind of how the soul would be portrayed. Bugs Bunny is wafting his way. What is that? What is it even? Even as I'm speaking, it sounds so confusing. But it's essential. So in Ecclesiastes... Uh, chapter 3, verse 11, this is what it says. He has made everything, this God, He, capital H, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. This concept of eternity resting in us, placed by God. It says no one can fathom. It's, it, 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 the imagination, it, what we got, the tools in our hands, in our heads, isn't enough. That only God can truly commune with that aspect of it. It's a, it's a piece of eternity. And I think I think we understand the aspect of when our soul is longing more than what our soul even is. I I can imagine times, and maybe you can too, an empty feeling, like my my life seems put together, but there's this disquiet, an emptiness, a, a, a longing, a yearning for something more. And I feel like it drives every one of us. This isn't a Christian-only thing. If you've tuned in today and you're not a Christian, this is for everybody. Everybody longs. 
everybody feels this emptiness, this emptiness of what we would call the soul. And it prompts people. It prompts people to go further, to look for something, to, to fill it. Is, is it do, I, do I fill it with other people? Do I fill it with ambition, with greed, with money, with sex, with drugs, with, with, with friendships, with whatever it may be? The longing of the soul can drive us to lengths we never thought were possible in ourselves. That we feel when our soul is dissatisfied. I think that's so important to, to, to keep in context. The Bible talks in Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the stream of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Imagine you're thirsty on, a, on, a, on a, a warm day like today. Hopefully you're not watching this in January, but imagine a, a hot heat wave August day. Ooh, it's, it's been a couple hours. You haven't had anything to drink and you're just, you're a little parched. And ooh, a glass of water would be nice. That is the barest tip that the soul pants for God when when we haven't had that connection in a while, I could just really, the soul yearns for God. Thirst. So how, how with this soul, this thing that's it's hard to define, this piece of eternity that is in, inside of us, how do we love God with it? See, the, the thing about uh, the soul, the Hebrew understanding of soul is it is a totality of being. It is the entirety of your physical being and ability and your personality together. You, you, you can't really separate the two in the ideology. It is your soul is the totality of who you are. So how do we love God with the totality of who we are? And, and it made me think, Jesus, how, you've shown us the way. You, you don't give us a directive and let us guess on how to do it. You've shown us the way. How, where in your word have you shown us the way? And, and I feel like in Luke chapter 7, uh, there's somebody that comes along and just shows us the panting of her soul. So, so why don't we read? I'm going to start in the first part, analyze, go to the second part. Is Luke chapter 7. I'm starting in verse 36. It says, One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went with the Pharisee to his house. He took his place at the table, and there was a woman in that town who had lived a sinful life. She learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with a special jar of perfume. She stood behind Jesus and cried at his feet, and she began to wet his feet with her tears so that she wiped them with her hair. She kissed them and poured perfume on them. The Pharisee who invited Jesus saw this. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, yo, if this guy, if he was a prophet, he would know who is touching him. He would know what kind of woman she is. She's a sinner. So, this story introduces us to, to two Kind of very different people. One, we got the, the Pharisee. We, later on in the Bible, we find out this guy's name is Simon. So we got Simon the Pharisee here. He invited Jesus over for some dinner. That's, a, that's actually quite hospitable of him. Like Jesus came in and he's saying he's the Son of God he, here on earth, the Messiah you've been waiting for. That's me, dog. And this Pharisee, the leader of the Hebrew religion at the time, he's like, all right, well, I guess I'll open my door to him. It, being a Pharisee, he's a well-respected member of the community. Remember, leader of the Hebrew religion at that time. Well-respected. He, he had to have a clean reputation to be in that place and to be a leader and teacher of the law. He, to, to people to look to him, he had to live a certain lifestyle and live it in a good way. He must have had a, a nice enough home to invite Jesus and 12 other guys to, hey, come sit around my table. So he, he had enough well to do to have a table that big, a room that big, 
a, a, a purse that big to feed all those people? And so not everything about Simon, we, we often push up the idea of the Pharisees and the Sadducees as these straw man arguments of, aren't they complete idiots? Aren't they like evil walking the earth, but with nice... Ro-? No, 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 no. Simon's a real human being. He, he had some good qualities to him. We, later on, though, we, we learn some not so great, the, the more humanness of him, if you will, that he had great things on the outside. That was a nice home. That was actually a nice dinner invitation. Dinner was nice. Uh, but in his head, his thinking wasn't so nice. Not saying what he thought out loud. He, he was critical, like, yo, if this guy, if this guy was really a prophet, there's no way he'd let this woman touch him. Wouldn't even, wouldn't even let this woman look at him. She's a sinner. How could... No prophet would let a sinner touch him like this. This is all in his head. This is all in his thoughts, his thinking. So let's look at the other person. The the sinful woman, if you will. She had lived a sinful life. This is, everybody in town knew her. Oh, yo, you're talking about that lady? Oh, we, we heard some stuff about that lady. Yo, the things she can do, the things she would do, the things she did do. Yo, that lady's a sinner, dog. She she was familiar with the idea of sin. And and what we can read in the context in the story that that she felt such guilt, such shame, such regret. This reputation of the community followed her and followed her. That she's familiar with judgment and criticism and rejection. And I think that that's something we've all somewhat been familiar with in our life. The feel of regret, the feel of somebody's judgment and condemnation and the shame that just weighs us down in our heart. The, the consequences of our decisions, whether they're reflected out in the physical reality, we feel them. That this woman felt such guilt and she comes to Jesus giving the deepest part of herself. That she cared more about Jesus than she did about her reputation in her community. She, she, she had a bad rap. People knew her. Yet she gate-crashed a party. Gate-crashed this meal. No invitation. That she took a step of monumental boldness to show Jesus how she felt. She could have been kicked out. She could have been humiliated. And she said, I'm going to take the chance. It doesn't matter what other people think. I'm going to do it. Where did that boldness come from? Could you imagine a community pariah always known as the, the sinner, the unclean she would have been? And I guess it might have been the straw that broke the camel's back. She said, this is my one opportunity. I'm going to take it. Who knows if Jesus is going to come by here again? We also know that she opened herself up and was vulnerable and unguarded with Jesus. It said that she stood behind him at his seat at the table and cried. It wasn't like uh, she had her hood up and she's just gently... People saw. The, The whole party saw it. People knew. She knelt at the feet of Jesus and wept. Now this isn't just like crying. Oh, it's such a... Oh, that scene in that movie really got me going. That's so sad what happened to them. This is the ugly... <laughs> her whole being is wrapped and her eyes 
are flooding tears so much they, they, they wetted the feet of Jesus and she took her hair and just cleaned it. I'm, that she had found something to take away the shame, to take away all these feelings she's felt, to, that there was forgiveness in front of her and her very being responded that her soul had been thirsty for so long and the water was in front of it. Her creator was in front of her and she couldn't help but have the emotions overcome her. She even brought a special jar of perfume. Now, the, this perfume was costly. This isn't like a, a, a 50 quid bottle from, from Boots. This is a costly, her life savings is this perfume. Without this perfume, there is no value. Who would look at her twice then? This perfume is costly. And she poured it on the feet of Jesus. The part of the body that would be dirtied the quickest anywhere you walk, sandals, you're in the Middle East, you're going to get dirt. You walk, sandals go down to the, the Tesco on the high street, you're going to get dirt on your feet. Imagine without paved roads. And yet she poured it on the feet of Jesus. That her soul demanded this of her. That my creator is in front of me. I must, I must give him everything. She wasn't doing this for self-grandizing, to make a name for herself, to, to ease the reputation. She was doing it for the one. For the one. And she knew. She knew what was going on. Everyone at the table is seeing this. This, this, isn't, this isn't just a small act. This woman is bearing her soul to Jesus. Luke 7, chapter, or Luke chapter 7, verse 40. Jesus answers Simon, saying, I have something to tell you. My man who thinks he's got it all figured out, I got something for you. Simon says, tell me, teacher. Two people owed money to a certain lender. Now, the, the guy's like, okay, whoa, 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 okay. I was expecting, like, the answer to life's questions, and you're posing a story to me, but gee, Jesus goes on, two people owed money to a certain lender. One owed him 500 silver coins. The other owed him 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he let them go without paying. Which of them will love him more? Now Simon, he, he replies, he says, you know, I, I suppose the one who owed the most money, you know, there's a 450 silver coin difference there. Now that, that last sentence, the 450, that's me adding in. Jesus says to him, you're right. He then turned to the woman. He said to Simon, do you see this woman? And what a, what a, what a, a rhetorical question that is. How could you miss her? Everyone knows this. How could you miss her? Jesus says, I came into your house you didn't give me water to wash my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair. You didn't even give me a kiss walking in, a warm embrace. But this woman has not stopped kissing my feet since I came in. She's weeping to her Lord. 
kissing, pouring, like her whole everything is being poured in here. You didn't put any olive oil on my head, but she has poured this perfume on my feet. So I tell you this, Simon. I'll tell you this. You want answers? This is me, this is me adding in. You want answers, Simon? Mr. Guy who, who's a Pharisee knows it all? I'll give you answers. You want answers? I'll tell you this. Her many sins have been forgiven. She has shown that she understands this by her great acts of love. But whoever has been forgiven only a little loves only a little. This woman has shown us this here that we get the joy of reading today is the roadmap. You want to know how to love God with all your soul? You don't hide a thing. You bear it all to God. That shame, that guilt, that condemnation, whatever negative you've, you've bear it all to God. You recognize who God is. That thing, your soul, your piece of eternity in your heart has been yearning and panting for. You bear it all to Him. You don't hold anything back. Because propriety says so. Because, oh, I just, this is the way I, I was raised. You know, we're not, we're not people to like hold our hands up and praise. We're not, we're not emotional. We don't cry like that. That's, that's just not what we do. Jesus is saying that the Bible is saying that's not how it is. You're wrong. There's an old song uh, that, that I quite love. Uh, back in America, there's a man named Bishop Patterson. He passed away a few decades ago. Um, but I've, I've watched his teaching, uh, his old video cassettes, if you will, actual video cassettes. I, I've watched his teaching. Uh, and he, he sang a song one time that is always kind of just like stuck in my head. And it goes, the Bible is right and somebody's wrong. The Bible is right and somebody's wrong. I'm not going to sing the whole thing, but it just makes me think. When people think this propriety says this, my culture says this, and the Bible actually says that? Your culture's wrong. My culture's wrong. My upbringing's wrong at that point. Because the love, the Lord your God with all of your soul, nothing can be held back. Not by tradition, not by culture, not by pride and propriety. It all needs to be laid out at the feet of Jesus. What we hold value and think is priceless poured at the feet of Jesus. Yeah, but I could, but God, you don't get it. Like here in England, like football culture, my kid plays football, so and that happens on a Sunday, so we got to go to practice on a Sunday. Now, this might be offending a lot of people here, um, and if I need to have a talk with Ian afterwards, we're going to have that talk, but I'm going to say what I'm going to say, what I feel like God is saying. God, you don't get it, but football practice happens on a Sunday. i got to take my kids there. Now, I'm not saying Sunday church is the, the end-all, be-all, and that's where your relationship with God starts and ends. But that thought process bleeds over into other parts of your life. What have you created as something precious that you are refusing to pour out on the feet of Jesus? Because I'll tell you this, your soul is begging you to. Your soul is panting for a touch, a taste, a drink of God, and you're holding back. Yeah, but you don't get it. For us, that for, for, for my family, for my, my city, for my culture, for what it, my nationality, whatever it may be, you, got, you just don't get it. That's wrong. 
You've got to pour it out. It is everything poured out to the feet of Jesus. So what, it, what fully does that look like in today's context? Oh, let's start with church. Let's start with the, 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 the gathering of the people. That's during worship. And I, I'm saying this as somebody who's, who does this all the time. Weirdly, there's no better time to start planning your week than Sunday at 1045, right when that first chord starts. And if, you're, if you go to Loughton, Rob's playing or Haley's playing or the, the youth is playing here at Woodford, there's no better time to start planning your week than when that first drum of guitar goes and your mind is just like, all right, Monday, then Tuesday, then Wednesday. What loving God with all your soul is, is leaving that all behind. Is focusing solely on Him. Of the debt that you were forgiven. And I'll tell you, it wasn't coins. It was death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Your forgiven debt was death. You've been given life. I have been given life. So it's in worship you are praising God. Oh my gosh, I cannot imagine the life I would be living, what is awaiting for me in eternity. God, you are just... And that's not proprietiveness. That's not... It's more than that, guys. It's more than that. Can you show me a place in the Bible that when somebody encountered Jesus, that they just stood there? That they were silent? That they were just respectful? These people wept, jumped for joy, hollered, couldn't wait to tell people. In our everyday life, in quote unquote our Monday to Saturday, what does that look like? That looks like time on your own going to the Father, sharing your woes and your joys. I get that this might cut into my TV time, to my hobby time, to my, my reading time, to my whatever. It's going to the Father. It's reading His Word. It's seeking Him in the quiet place, in the private place, where it's just me and Him. It's all of it, guys. The whole, whole bit of us. So let's not worry about reputation what people think about us, what our culture says we should, what it's always been, what is tradition said. Let's, what does the Bible say? That's what I'm going off here. If, I, if, I've, if I've gone too far and I've gone off the script of the Bible, please, you are free to contact me at dustin.pruitt at restorecc.org.uk. If that's too much for you, you can call the church phone number. I, I don't know that off the top of my head. Uh, come to me. If you think I've been wild, if I've been outlandish, please come talk to me. But I feel like this is what God is saying to us, to saying to restore to His people. Will you love me with all of your soul? I've shown you the way. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Let's pray. God, with all that we are, God, with all of it, with all of it, with all of it, to you, to you, our Father, our Savior, our Creator, our strong tower, our provider, our rescuer, everything. God, I could, the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And you are worthy of every epitaph, of every title, of every breath and word of glory. Because without you, I'd be lost. I'd be nothing. 
but inside of me you have placed a piece of your eternity. And it longs and it yearns and it pants to be in connection with you again. God, let me not stop it. Let me not be in the way. Let me not hold something back, but God, give it all to you. Because you are worthy of every last bit. And I know I can trust you with every bit of it. Every bit. Because you are loving and you are faithful. As, as far as this relationship goes, you loved first, you sacrificed first. So I'll do the same. I'll just come in second place, if that's all right. But I love you. We love you, God. It's in your name that we pray. We all say, Amen. Thank you for sticking around, guys. Please do not miss out on the rest of this series. I think it is so important in where God is guiding us as this new generation. If you're part of the old generation, you, you, welcome aboard, you're a part. I, I'm sitting here as a millennial. We're, we're all a part of this new generation and where God is taking us. So please continue to tune in. You do not want to miss. Even on holiday, tune in, guys. Until then, bye.